Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the seventh season of the Stuart Regan Visionary Series. This is an annual program that honors leading international thinkers and doers that enhance contemporary life and culture and shape the future through their practice. This goes to the heart of what the New Museum's core principles are, which are to question, to provoke, uh, to surprise, and to complicate, and to always lead into the future. So over the past six years, we've honored Bill T. Jones, Jimmy Wales, Alice Waters, Maya Lynn, Matthew Weiner, and Darren Aronofsky. And tonight, it is an incredible pleasure to welcome and honor the acclaimed American writer, Hilton Alls. Hilton has long been associated with the New Yorker magazine. He started as a contributor to Talk of the Town, I think, in 1994. Later? 1989. And became <laughs> their award-winning theater critic in 2002. Wow, everything is totally wrong in the literature. <laughs> uh, but I, you are the author of two extraordinary books. <laughs> the Women and your intertwining essay, uh, White Girls. So it can be said that your essays have redefined the possibilities of that essay form and can be truly called Hilton-esque. Thank you for being here tonight. I don't know what's taken so long for you to get here. <laughs> we go back. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to get you out of the house. We go back such a long time, and we were both friends of Stuart Regan, who was a force in contemporary culture. He had a leading gallery in L.A. that showcased top talent when no one else was, was doing it, uh, but whose interest in activities really extended way beyond the gallery. So the Visionary Series is made possible by the Stuart Regan Visionaries Fund, created in 2008 by Barbara Gladstone to honor Regan. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara, for your generosity, and also to the Charlotte and Bill Ford Artist Talks Fund for their additional support. And now to do a proper introduction <laughs> is our Director of Special Projects, Richard Flood. <laughs> Welcome. It's really wonderful to see you all here tonight, and so many friends and uh, so many people who I will be seeing more of in the future, I hope. It's a great pri privilege and pleasure to welcome Hilton as our visionary for 2016. We feel proud that he not only agreed to join us, but he chose to take the hard way round by deciding to write a brand new essay rather than, in, rather than indulge in a proffered interview. The fact that the essay's topic is Diane Arbus in Manhattan doubled our excitement. Hilton is known for inhabiting his subjects, and Arbus seems to be the perfect vessel for his excavation. The two of them both know how to look, how to make their looking be of consequence, how to find the darkest corners on the brightest of days. They also know when compassion is called for and the more difficult path when it muddies the truth. I've been reading Hilton for more years than seemed possible, and I still remember the first time I encountered the women and knew something new had sailed into our cultural harbor. It was a thrilling experience. I imagine something like a, la a landfall was for uh, the great explorers of legend. So now I will torture one final metaphor and invite you to set sail with our incomparable visionary explorer, Hilton Alls.
just have to say something. Um, I'm so glad that you're seeing her um, because I'm, I've met her nephew who was Howard Nemiroff's son and he's written a wonderful book about his um, aunt and brother, uh, her brother, brother. And I met Howard Nemiroff and he is one of the most beautiful people I've ever seen. The whole family was, is gorgeous in that way. Um, they all look like Montgomery Clift, like some version <laughs> of Montgomery Clift. And, uh, and um, he told a story about his father um, thought that when Dion gave up painting, um, she lacked seriousness. And the one picture he had of hers was the tw famous twins pic picture was sort of crumpled in his desk. And um, Howard Nemiroff is a really good poet, and she's a really good photographer, and I hope that they have a makeup conversation somewhere. Um, but I'm going to embarrass some of our friends just a little while before we turn to this. Um, I will try to make this preface as brief as possible so we can all drink sooner than not and have the evening end in elegance. I am intensely grateful to Richard Flood and Lisa Phillips here at the New Museum for their graciousness and for hosting this event. And I want to extend my hand in friendship and gratitude to Barbara Gladstone for the generosity and braveness it took to establish the Stuart Regan Lectures. I say brave because for those of us who knew Stuart and loved him, it was not hard to do, he was very attractive. It is always like something sharp to the heart to know he is not here to protect us. Because that truth, the truth is, in this life, one is lucky to know, at most, seven or six people who have your back, all the way down the line. And Stuart did not measure his friends according to how they were doing and how he was doing, but all according to how he felt, what was in his heart. He was a pure soul, during a time defined by great sadness, AIDS, and avarice. And also, he was a fantastic audience if you were funny or crazy. <laughs> Once, I stayed in his old house, the house he and Sean lived, had it a long time ago when they were just starting their business, and it was hot as hell there. And so to amuse myself, I watched pay-per-view porn in his bedroom. I don't think I was thinking about Stuart while I did so. In any case, I thought I could pay for my entertainment, quote unquote, by credit card. This was in the old days, a time of answering machines and faxes. But it went on Stuart's bill. And because I'm a guilty person, I told him what I had done immediately, and he just laughed and laughed. And that is what I want you to take away this evening. Stuart sitting somewhere here, having a laugh, and then phoning Sean to tell her about the evening and then escorting his much-loved mother to dinner and laughing with her some more. Another preface. I received the most startling email from the ever-brilliant poet Angus Cook the other day. He had read something I'd written, and he said, you write about art as though it's visual. I thought this was the most extraordinary statement I'd heard in a while. <laughs> it dropped me down a delicious existential well, because it isn't art visual? What Angus was saying was this, most people treat it as theory or something to theorize about, and if that is your scene, you should leave now. Also, one other note, I pronounced Diane Diane the way her mother preferred, the French pronunciation, because she was a little pretentious. Still, <laughs> still she was Diane Arbus' mother, and I bow down to her for that. Uh, this piece is called Diane Arbus in Manhattan, and I was fortunate enough to read um, two pages of it, uh, work, work on it over a period of months, um, and read two pages of it at a conference where Dune Arbus, uh, Diane Arbus's eldest daughter was, who was so supportive then and subsequently. So thank you, Dune, and thank you, Amy, her second child, who was also incredibly supportive when she came to hear a little bit of an early version. So I think this is the final, and thanks for coming. Deanna Arbus in Manhattan. Sometimes when a person we've admired or loved 
leaves the, leaves the scene prematurely, it can feel, at least to me, as if, as if they've gotten up from their desk in the middle of composing a letter, one that they have permanently left unfinished. We've all done the first part, started a missive, gotten up from our desk to stretch, scratch our head, and wondered then how we could get on with it. Letter writing is hard. It remains one of the more personal forms of communication left to us. Still, there are some who never make it back to that desk. They have their reasons. But we're awfully hard on the dead. We complain that they leave us wanting, but that's just one way of not facing what they've been generous enough to leave us, including all those lovely half-finished letters. Obviously, I'm using letter writing as a kind of metaphor, but not in an Emily Dickinson, here is my letter to the world that never wrote to me way. <clears throat> in the end, I'm setting up the epistolary tone for him to come, a note I'm addressing to Deanne Arbus, who wrote brilliant letters and whose photographs taken together are a kind of brilliant letter too. By addressing her as Deanne, I am bringing her life and work back to the idea of correspondence, the trading of one thought because it inspires another over the distance of time. For a number of years now, Deanne, for months and days, I have been sitting with your pictures, black and white photographs that have changed the world and have changed me. And your influence and myth is so pervasive and conclusive. After looking at your work, one has to readjust one's vision, which perforce fucks with or trivializes your more mundane photo making contemporaries. That our present day reality looks less real for you not having seen it first. Your vision rests on my eyes and shoulders like a solid, something I have to adjust and readjust to in order to keep moving because many of your pictures feel like the last word about queerness, about coupling, about people finding their own society or not, their own costuming or not, in temporary homes and nudist camps and movie theaters, all in or near your great narrative, which is to say Manhattan. Because that is the way it is with you, Deanne. You devoured the island of your birth and gave it back to itself reimagined but not reconfigured. And I wonder what it, was, what it could have meant to have that kind of power in a city heavily populated by other people who subscribe to their rival myth too, even if they'd been born in Brooklyn. Because that's Manhattan's dominant or collective story, people arriving and reinventing themselves in a city whose citizens don't so much celebrate what you, first, what you recorded first seated man in a bra, the lady in the fur hat, or the kid with the hand grenade, as treat them as figures, it's the better part of valor to take note of and move away from, given that one's survival in the city depends, in part, in understanding that New Yorkers crave attention, but will fuck you up if you get in their face. And that's what you did. You got in people's faces, and that's certainly one reason your photographs were reviled by some viewers when you exhibited them in the new document show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1967. I bet the angry New Yorkers who saw your work saw it as a double negative, certainly where New York etiquette was concerned. You got in your subject's face and then put their face in the spectator's face. It was outrageous and you added insult to that particular injury by getting the subjects to agree to it. None of that cartier Brazon derived stuff of catching people, events, flowers, cars on the fly. You were in conversation with your sitters, a social exchange resulting in a kind of emotional documentary that became metaphysical as that terrible and beautiful alchemy took place, which is to say the city, sitter you looking at the sitter, the cameras click and sometimes flash. You were born and raised and loved and raised children and died in the city, so you were cognizant of Manhattan and her risks. You said once, 
I have this funny thing, which is that I'm never afraid when I'm looking in the ground glass. This person could be approaching you with a gun or something like that, and I'd have my eyes glued to the finder, and it was like I wasn't really vulnerable. It just seemed terrific what was happening. I mean, I'm sure there are limits. God knows when the troops start advancing on me, <clears throat> you do approach that stricken feeling where you perfectly well can get killed. But I bet you perfectly well knew you weren't, wouldn't get killed given that you had charm on your side and frankness, an infectious combination. Actually, I think I'm kind of two-faced, you said, describing your part in the drama of the sitting, working your way into your subject's pores, their soul, a process, I like that. Uh, it's very comforting somehow. <clears throat> I think I'm kind of two-faced, you said, describing your part in the drama of the sitting, working your way into your subject's pores, their soul, a process that revealed as much about you as it did them. You continued, I'm very ingratiating. It really kind of annoys me. I'm just sort of a little too nice. Everything is, ooh. I hear myself saying, how terrific. And there's this woman making a face. I really mean it's terrific. I don't mean I wish I looked like that. I don't mean I wish my children looked like that. I don't mean in my private life I want to kiss you. But I mean that's amazingly, undeniably something. You were always looking for something on an island filled with some things. In one 1968 letter you wrote to your friend, the art director and painter Marvin Israel, I went to the Grand Central Ladies Room to find your nomads, but the matron said there was on, only that one Negro lady with rag shoes, and she hadn't seen her for a while. As you looked for some things, you became something yourself a funny New York Jewish something filled with guilt and amusing existential questions. In another early letter to Israel, you said, I'm not ghoulish, am I? I absolutely hate to have a bad conscience. I think it is lewd. There was a lady stretched out on the ground, fallen, I think, yesterday, weeping, and saying to the cops, please help me with one shoe off and covered with a blanket waiting for an ambulance, which came on Lexington Avenue and 57th Street. Is everyone ghoulish? I wouldn't, it wouldn't, I wouldn't turn out to be a bad person if I looked anyway. Would it make a difference if I turned away? Which is precisely the point, Deanne, or one of them. No artist worth their salt, pain, humor, steeliness, selfishness, generosity, love, ruthlessness, or plain interest in other people and things can turn away. You did not turn away from Stormé de Lavare. She was just one of your early somethings. Born in New Orleans in, the, in 1920 to a white mother and a black father, Stormé was a star at the Jewel Box Review in the East Village. It was one of the city's first integrated drag clubs. There, Stormé was a gentleman MC, dressed in a dark suit or a tuxedo or a sailor suit she introduced and supported the ladies who had what Stormé did not. In any case, I got to interview the great black star from one of the Voice's queer pride issues, and I can't remember the year, but I remember this. Stormé telling me you were such a charmer, Deanne, hanging around backstage. This was when queer people could be busted for being queer or, more likely, back blackmailed for it, and yet the stars at the jewel box trusted you and I think part of the high for them and for you was the then novel experience of a more or less straight white woman hanging out in a place she had no business being and finding the denizens, if not beautiful, then at least interesting. You loved all those various tensions. You said, I work from awkwardness. By that I mean I don't like to arrange things. If I stand in front of something instead of arranging it, I arrange myself. This is an extraordinary statement, one that gets to the heart of your New York heart. New Yorkers adapt themselves to any situation, even fear of love. We run from vulnerability, not only because we can, but we feel we must. 
This city is eating us alive. Time is eating us alive. There is never enough of any of it, time ourselves, to go around to all that diversity, and yet we do arrange ourselves around that difference, the better to understand it in ourselves and our life in the city. As an artist, Deanne, you lived in worlds where being white didn't have much cachet, but being Jewish did. Everybody in New York knows about the Jews' history of difference, even when they don't, because everyone in New York is Jewish. A refugee from worlds where they had to adjust or continually rearrange themselves, not so much to fit in as not be killed. And if the charming such as yourself are not survivors, then I don't know who is. In any case, you weren't immune to Stormay's charms either. I love the flirt in your portraits of her, some of which were taken on a park bench in what I assume is Central Park because of the topography. It's too hilly to be Washington Square Park, another New York public area you treated like a private studio. For a while, you treated Coney Island and Times Square that way, too. New York was your studio. In a 1968 letter to the British editor, Peter Cookson, you wrote, as only a quintessential New Yorker could have written, I haven't been to the country, not even Coney Island. <clears throat> But the parks have turned so pretty. For weeks, I wandered in them just photographing babies like I was everyone's mother. Oh, Deanne, you did actually mother, and your legacy continues in the oddest ways. For instance, how amazing to borrow one of your words, to meet and be with Stormay years after you met her, and to feel her embrace before I left off interviewing her. It remains one of the great erotic moments of my young life her muscles and breasts pressed against me, a memory that leads to another which was visiting Stormé at Henrietta on Hudson, a bar on Hudson Street in Lower Manhattan. It was maybe a year or two after I'd interviewed her and she was working as a bouncer. And I went to visit with a female friend and her colored male lover, a man who looked not unlike Stormé. And I remember on that afternoon, Stormé bought my female friend a drink and she fell for my friend right in front of us because my female friend had what you had, charm. But the world was different already. You didn't have to go to the jewel box to find queer people who expressed themselves. It was all out there in the open, presumably. That's the last time I talked to Stormé, I think. It was spring, and already the girls were out in their summer dresses. Life in Manhattan, with its pebbles in the concrete, its big time, small town attitude, and private life in public spaces. You knew every bit of it, or nearly every bit of it. It's nearly 23 miles land area all told. How do Manhattanites do it? Pack in an average of 70,000 people per square mile. It's the most densely populated borough of the five boroughs that make up New York City. And what about the dense population of spirits that first made Manhattan? Let's start with the Lenape Indians, and then in 1524, the Florentine explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano entering the Narrows on his ship. And oh, history is so murky and cruel. And before you know it, the Dutch were buying what they called New Netherland from the Lenapes, and how horrible. Peter Stuyvesant came along in 1624 I just have to get my Louis Armstrong handkerchief out. Hold on. <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> and in 1524, the Florentine explorer Giovanni de Verrazzano entering the Narrows on his ship. And oh, history is so murky and cruel, and before you know it, the Dutch were buying what they called New Netherland from the Lenapes, and how horrible. Peter Stuyvesant came along in 1624 because of Dutch fur trading, but I'm getting it wrong. The fur business, which your family was in, was set up on a trade settlement that was Governor's Island, but wait, there was Peter Stuyvesant in 1647 being appointed the Dutch Director General of the Colony, also known as Manhattan, or maybe that was some other time. In any case, the English took over in 1664 and renamed the island New York after the Duke of York 
And somehow the Dutch were still around, and it's interesting. All the blood that shed and corruption that kills and plain order that goes into making a place, not to mention the ghosts. And in any, and in any case, you knew every, nearly every part of Manhattan, Dian, having lived in so many areas of it. You spent your first two and a half years from 1923 until mid-1924 mid or so at 115 West 73rd Street. I've been there. From mid-1924 until 1929, you lived with your family at 1133 Park Avenue near 90th Street. I've been there. From 1929 until late 1931, you lived with your family at 1185 Park Avenue. I've been there. And in 1932, you moved with your family to the San Remo, an imposing, elegant apartment building on Central Park West. I have also been there. Subsequent homes you shared with your parents, husband, Alan, and then your children as a single parent include 888 Park Avenue, 325 East 37th Street, 319 East 72nd Street, Charles Street, East 68th Street, 71 Washington Square Place, 120 East 10th Street, and the last, apartment 945B at West Bath, a block long housing complex bound by West Street, Bethune Street, Bank Street, and Washington Streets. It was the former home of Bell Laboratories where inventors worked on the transistor radio, television, and a few other things. All of these addresses add up to a kind of Dan Arbus Museum or perhaps more accurately, a series of museum arcades with archways that read achievement and commodities during the time you lived with your parents, stars of the merchant class. In another letter to Israel, who was brought up in a class similar to yours, you wrote, Diane, our bourgeois heritage seems to me glorious as any stigma, especially to see it reflected back and forth in the mirror of each other. It is magic, and magic chooses any guise. It always makes me laugh in the middle of some unbelievable instant to think how our parents would approve of each other. That is the joke we are on them and us and it. To be so Jewish and rich and middle class and from good families and to run so variously away from it that we come full circle and bump into each other like they say in the comics, boing. <laughs> your, life admits, your life amidst achievements and commodities led to what I call perverse commodities, such as your interest in dreams and magic, such as the stuff you found in Penny Arcades and Hubert's Museum in Times Square with its fleas and Jungle Creek and all the other curiosities that are in New York. In her poem, New York, Marianne Moore wrote, New York, the savages romance, accreted where we need the space for commerce, the center of the wholesale fur trade, starred with teepees of ermine and peopled with foxes. It was as if Moore was writing certain aspects of your autobiography, certainly when it came to the family business I'm and I'm telling you another thing. I know from your pictures or the world of your pictures that savage and romance are words you understand in any description of New York because that was the world of your pictures. It took you more than 20 years to become yourself. That is, the post-fashion photographs with your former partner, Alan Arvis self, the Deanne Arvis of the black and white twins and loser at a diaper derby and Jewish giant at home and girl in a shiny dress, and so on. And in a way, your sentimental education could be described as passing from the romance one associates with your background, which you have described as feeling unreal, to you finding the savagery in New York streets and arcades that wiped away the gunk of respectability that made your flesh crawl, which may have included the makeup of your mother's generation with its furs and pearls and servants in other rooms, closed off, children muted by rugs and windows and bed dusters, and again, those nannies who spoke the language of love in an unknown tongue. It's funny, but sometimes when I think of you as a young girl growing up in Manhattan 
and then becoming the artist you became, I see a coat, and the coat has a fur collar. And then, as you become an artist, the fur collar starts to molt, and your coat goes from something like velvet to something like wool. The pattern is bumpy. In any case, my dream of your overcoat is probably based on the women I knew growing up in the 1960s. Those women in those cloth overcoats went to market with not much else but those coats and their charm and eyes, trying to get more with less to feed their families, and that's what you did too. You worked your way backwards, economically speaking, to understand something of survival. You evolved into a woman who explored the world market filled with people, customs, rituals, disasters, connections, love, Christmas trees, fake sets in Disney World, the better to understand what you might have wrought in the world. In a 1960 postcard to your friend, Marvin Israel, you wrote, I am sitting in the meat market waiting for the heads. And in a 1968 note to the producer Stuart Stern, you said, I think it's better to start from scratch than anywhere. <clears throat> It's interesting how relatively few female interpreters of your work they've been, but Susan Sontag, for one, was never what you might call a feminist. In any case, I think she and eventually other writers categorized your ambition, the ambition of the artist, as distinctly male, and your eyes a kind of ripoff, taking from the world what it needed, but giving nothing back. But how to explain what you said in this letter? I think it hurts a little to be photographs, photographed, or this. I don't press the shutter, the image does, and it's like being clobbered. Your interest in continuity and narrative, going back again and again to see the kids in Washington Square Park, the kids in Untitled, and Eddie the Dwarf, and the 1968 series labeled Catherine Bruce, Bruce Catherine, which are pictures about transformation, among other things, such as what fashion is and how it affects the world, one person at a time. Starting out in fashion didn't hurt you, Deanne, in terms of understanding what we look like in front of and behind the curtain of clothing. You were an extraordinary fashion photographer if the fashion was hung on other people. You said to a friend in another letter, Last week, I looked up the word anomaly because I always thought it meant a fish out of water, but I knew it was wrong, and I was right. It means something not subject to analogy or true, or something odd or strange or exceptional, and I saw the connection between freaks and eccentrics, the exception to every rule. The same might be said of the artists. They have to be exception to the rules of the past in order to make their own futures. Before you started Catherine Bruce, Bruce Catherine, you said, Deanne, the female impersonators are the real examples of playing a single role because one forms only one kind of woman which has precious little to do with the kind of man they look like and you can't see one behind the other. It looks like a leap into a new doom. The doom, of course, had to do with existence, and the doom of being a photographer who knew how to wait for the image. Once you said that after photographing all day, you may not end up with anything at all, so you might as well give up and just go to the movies. You waited for Bruce to get done up to show and not show himself to you, and in that waiting, you were different than Frank and Winogrand and the others you're sometimes lumped in with because you weren't treating the image as a kind of journalism, but the record of a fantasy of magic ground through the glass of the real. Shaping metaphors out of the real is the work of an artist or those artists who know there's something better on the other side of daydreaming, such as Bruce Catherine's dream that she's Catherine Bruce. Both are real, both are manufactured, and both are citizens of your Manhattan. Someone told me it's spring, you wrote to Marvin Israel, but today everyone looked remarkable, all odd and splendid as freaks and nobody able to see himself, all of us victims of the special shape we come in. 
Much has been made of your subjects in their various shapes, but your subjects wouldn't have made those shapes without your humility, the near religious belief that your subjects, to borrow one of your words, was terrific because they longed to be seen as much as you, you wanted to see and believe in them. But you weren't pious about the exchange, just ecstatic when it worked. As ecstatic and calm as Walt Whitman was when he wrote in 1900, Manhattan streets I sauntered, pondering on time, space, reality. On such as these and abreast with them, prudence. The soul is of itself, all verges to it, all has reference to what ensues. All that a person does, says, thinks, is of consequence. The indirect just as much as the direct. The spirit receives from the body just as much as it gives to the body, if not more. <clears throat> Most of us treat civil rights as though it were a freeing agent or a magic cure for the world's alienation or your alienation. But that's just jive if you really think about it. Loneliness surrounds us like a Jesus halo, especially in Manhattan, where privacy is and always shall be a Jane Jacobs issue. How do we negotiate space in the city and avoid emotional collisions as you make yourself socially acceptable to what? Other compartmentalized people who probably do what you do, which is to not give a thought to your civil rights as you reveal yourself to others in the lovely dark. Part of the greatness of, let's say, Deanne's contact sheet number 4,457, where we see a black man kissing or otherwise fondling a scantily clad white woman and then gently holding a nude arbus, so to speak, across his lap, is the conversation you, Deanne, bring to the fore as no one else could, and that conversation is about miscegenation an ever-present taboo. In that contact sheet, you show the questions such as, what does it mean for white skin to be draped across black skin? What does it mean to look at another white woman draped across black skin? You upset the balance of propriety of the status quo by asking those questions and dig it. Your white skin against that black skin upset one critic enough for her to say, that you were mad, and this was evidence of it. Deanne, it's clear that you didn't use a flash during this sitting because that black male skin, a double negative photographically speaking and erotically speaking, something else entirely, doesn't have much definition. But I think the point of the pictures is to remind us that New York will always be full of secrets like miscegenation a pairing that still startles the eye when you pass it on a street in Manhattan because it's still attached to narratives of dominance and submission, issues that poke the city's fabled liberalism in the eye. But this was nothing new to you. You saw race as another point of our collective difference. In 1965, you produced your extraordinary young man and his pregnant wife in Washington Square Park. In it, one sees a black man with what used to be called conked or straightened hair, the hair of a hipster pimp, and his arm is draped around his wife who wears her beehive and glasses like a totem, just as her husband's blackness is a kind of totem too. <clears throat> In 1969, you photographed children's fashions for the New York Times. The shoot took place in St. Thomas, a world of tall grass and heat, not your usual world, but you made it your world by casting the shoot with local kids. And I love the pictures, particularly the picture of the little girl in the shorts and jumper standing with a little boy who is slightly hiding from what? You, the son, you were the director and always in your pictures, even in the stuff you didn't like much, such as these pictures, has all that New York talk going on in them, which is to say analysis as you look for meaning and feeling. In any case, the fashion editor, Patricia Peterson, collaborated with you on the images. <clears throat> and to your former husband, but always best friend, Alan Arbus, you wrote about the shoot. There was a bit of trouble. P 
Pat said it was because the cover photo was of a black girl and a white boy about four, year, four years old holding hands. They wanted to retake, which they wanted a retake, which I think she has effectively blocked. She was full of appreciation for the most minor virtues of the photos and asked for the miscegenation junior style and may end up being regarded as a major civil rights breakthrough if they finally let it pass. Letting it pass, I think, is the point. This observation, with its little sigh of emotional and political exhaustion at the end, is precisely the sad fatigue that permeates Elizabeth Hardwick's great 1980 short story, Cross Town. In that piece, the author paints in those bits that Jane Jacobs sketched so widely and brilliantly in her seminal 1961 study, The Death and Life of Great American Cities. If Jacobs looked at Manhattan through a telescope, Hardwood looked at it through a microscope, and her lens was bathed in a savage romanticism. There was no easy truce between the Kentucky native and her adopted city, which infected her as it infected you, as a love that could not be cured. Hardwick wrote, under the moon, the taxi makes its way through the dark park, and a cassette of Rachmaninoff passes perhaps over the buried imprint of its own footsteps. Here, back once more awaiting the appearance of the night man, my neighbor can be seen walking her dog, a snub-nosed animal, the dog, with a strange dry body like tanned hide, a dog such as, as you see wandering in poor countries on the back streets of the West Indies. Reading that quote, Deanne, I can hear you in conversation with Lizzie. She was just your speed, a Manhattanite down to her skinny bones, smoking and talking and thinking in the meantime. And maybe in response to her dog story, you might have said, as you once told a classroom of young photography students, I don't particularly like dogs. Well, I love stray dogs, dogs who don't like people. And that's the kind of dog picture I would take if I ever took a dog picture. <clears throat> life in New York. Is it a dog's life? Hardwick continues with her neighbor's dog because all New Yorkers are noble-minded snoops. Maybe it was such a dog, she writes, that killed Verrazano when he went on from the East River and the Hudson River to the Caribbean. Such a dog and not the natives at all. Well, as we say today, that is what you pay for New York City. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, everyone. <laughs> Let me reiterate. And thank you so much, Hilton. Uh, that was an exquisite piece of writing and uh, a depth of understanding that I really will live with. Um, it's, you, are, you are a blessed person, and uh, your blessing went out to us tonight. Thank you.